Hello, everyone. So good to see all of you today. Uh, hey, before we jump into the word, first of all, I'm Josh, if you're new here, uh, one of the pastors. Glad that you're here today. Uh, wanted to let you guys know that um, for those of you who are parents who had your kids uh, at the wake uh, last Sunday night, that's our new, uh, our new youth group gathering, which happens on Sunday nights at the Northeast Building. Uh, John uh, wanted me to just give an update of how that went because I did like, worship for it. Uh, and it was awesome. Uh, we, we kind of prepared for about 25 kids just based upon what, what we've seen as, as the junior high attendance in the stairwell, which is not the most vibrant way to have youth ministry, putting the junior high kids in the stairwell. Uh, uh, but we actually end up having almost 50 kids show up uh, for it. So uh, it, was, it was amazing. And uh, yeah, it was great. Uh, and, the, and my son was there. He's like, I really like the new format. Uh, and I think the, the thing that we felt really strongly about is that for youth ministry to really succeed, uh, there needs to be a, uh, an evangelistic life to it. And it needs to have its own ethos. Uh, and uh, the stairwell is not an ethos. Uh, so uh, creating a space where the kids feel like they have a place that's their own is really, really essential. Uh, and so really excited about that. And if you have junior high or high school kids or you're sitting here as junior high or high school, we really encourage you uh, to, to make that a priority because it's a great way. Uh, we think that the essence of the Christian life is, uh, is relationship uh, and community uh, that, that comes together through the person of Jesus. And we think it's the same for the kids as it is for the adults. Uh, and we want you to begin, if, as a, if you're a high school, junior high student, we want you to experience community, intentional community um, now. And uh, this is a great place uh, to invite your friends to. Uh, and just so you know, there is uh, an epic ping pong table that I myself put together for the youth group that the staff utilizes daily. And I am not the worst player on the staff, which is also good, <laughs> nor am I the best. <laughs> uh, so, you know, two, I want to just state that this actually answers some questions that have arisen around us gathering here about the stewardship as a church of, of the Northeast building. Uh, and it's been really cool because uh, for those of you who haven't been able to come, uh, we've been doing the Roman study. And so for the last uh, six, we're going into week seven right now. Uh, I've been teaching through the Book of Romans Monday through Thursday at 6 a.m., and we're uh, beginning chapter 8. For those of you who have been coming, just so you know, the little schedule that I made, because I made it, there's a major mistake on it, which is this week is missing from the schedule. That was not intentional. That was just an accident. I just actually just didn't even notice. I just put the calendar down wrong. So someone's like, are we not meeting next week? No, we are. Uh, and as much as I would like to take the week off, because I am getting tired, uh, we're going to keep pushing through uh, all the way till the week of Christmas. So I thought it was an 11-week study, and I just discovered that it's a 12-week study. Uh, and, you know, honestly, for me, it's a gift to be able to serve the church in such a tangible way to show. I don't let those who help out with coffee show up early. I had Holly email. I'm like, I don't want anyone there before 545A, because I, I can't have a conversation at 5.30 in the morning. Uh, and I would love to have conversations after the, after the message. But uh, to be able to get there and make coffee for everyone every single day and uh, just to have that kind of responsibility and to be so embedded in the community and to have, I've been meeting tons of new people. Um, it's a, really a gift. But it's another way that we're utilizing that building. Uh, and, and also, we just moved our offices back there uh, last week. And so uh, the, the downstairs has been converted half of it into uh, office space for the staff. Uh, so we, we feel like we're stewarding the building well. And what's been really cool is Grace City, which is the church that's beginning to meet there on Sunday mornings while we're here, uh, their, uh, their staff and a, a good chunk of their community has come to every single, the, the lead pastor, uh, Simon, has been at every single Roman city. He hasn't missed one. Uh, and it's been really cool to kind of have our hearts knit together with, that we're helping a church uh, begin in a building that God has blessed us with, just like we had uh, the favor of Henson and were able to do Door of Hope at, at Henson Baptist in the Annex. 
uh, for the first five years. And so it's just really cool to see God's graciousness uh, in that we can be the ones that are, uh, are graciously allowing a church to start, start up. And it's a, it's a really, cool, really cool church. It's set, Simon's such a great guy. I would say that if you miss, you live by the Northeast location and you really miss the, the intimacy of that building, I, I, would with, I would gladly, although sadly, say, go be a part of Grace City because they're a great church and they, they, love, they love Jesus. And then I take that back. I don't really want you to leave, but you can. <laughs> okay, um, the final thing I want to just share with you guys, and really it'll connect with the message as well, is it would be wrong to not acknowledge uh, such a, a monumental week in our country uh, as a pastor uh, and, and a monumental uh, week for our city because Portland has been the most, uh, we've seen the most vitriol uh, over the outcome of the election um, pretty much of any city in the U.S. California. California is like threatening to secede uh, from, they're going to become their own country. They already are their own country. <laughs> I've lived in California. It is its own country. <laughs> it's its own universe, specifically Southern California. Uh, but I, I think that uh, we've been getting a lot of questions from people of how should we respond? And there's a lot of young people within the church uh, who, and I just think people in general, uh, when we live in an environment like Portland, we can become, everything we view is through a lens of the culture that's directly around us. Uh, and we see the people that are upset. I mean, I have friends who literally spent, you know, the day after the election crying all day. And I'm not saying that I, I, I'm not here to comment on the politics of the politicians that ran for the presidency. What I'm here to comment on is as a pastor and as a follower of Jesus, how should we as a church respond to the election, regardless if you are, uh, uh, regardless if you are upset about the election, how do you respond as a child maybe of parents in rural Oregon or Washington who uh, voted the exact opposite of you. Uh, how do we deal with as a church that the church is being targeted as the ones who put uh, Trump uh, in in office? We actually had a man come to our office the other day and just op- come in, was so upset, was screaming, saying that we that evangelicals are the ones who are responsible uh, for Trump being elected president. Uh, and, um, and just was, I mean, he was getting to the point where it was so confrontational. I'm like, do I need to physically remove this man from, because if someone comes in and if you've met my assistant and the office manager, Gina, uh, and you've met her, if you've met her, you would know that she is the sweetest human being on the planet. And when he points at her and goes, it's your fault. I'm like, all right, you just crossed the line. I'm where, <laughs> like... Those are, those are fighting words. It, nothing is Gina's fault. <laughs> it might be my fault, but it is not her fault. <laughs> uh, but, it, but it just shows how upset people are. They don't even know what to do with their anger. And so how do we as a church respond to that? And, and listen, I am not here to defend the, the, the horrible rhetoric that was utilized during the election, which, off, which we're seeing now is there's such a backing off of is clear that that fear was capitalized upon uh, to polarize uh, an already divided nation. There's no getting around that. What I am here to say is that Jesus Christ is our king, not Trump or Clinton. Uh, And our political system is what it is, a human system. And wherever humans are in control, there's this little thing that we believe is the fundamental uh, argument for, I agree with Chesterton, the greatest argument for Christianity is sin. Unfortunately, the greatest argument against Christianity is Christians, according to Chesterton. Uh, and, and the reason he says that isn't to say that Christians are bad, it's just that we, like everyone else, are infected with this thing called sin. Sin ultimately being a rebellion against God's rule. Nowhere is is it more prevalently seen a rebellion against God's sovereign rule than our nation as a whole. Um, And that is where we have the opportunity because where the days have been the darkest historically, the gospel has shined the brightest. And I think that that if you are feeling despondent and you're upset and you're in a depression over the election, listen, you woke up today and the sun still rose. 
You woke up today and you still got air in your, in your lungs. Uh, you have your health, uh, you have your voice. Yes, should we stand against injustice? Should we stand against uh, the declarations about, about people groups uh, that, that it seems as if there, there's, there's uh, definitely a racial divide uh, and there was rhetoric used that is really honestly quite terrifying to me uh, in the election. Should we stand against those things? Yes, we should, but we should never do it um, to the neglect of love. Uh, nor should we do it in a way that actually uh, we're not to participate in the vitriol that's being spewed right now. Uh, what we do is intelligently uh, and peacefully seek the peace of our city. And we do that by being a reflection of the gospel. And Jesus said, if you follow me, uh, you're gonna have tribulation uh, because the world will get worse before it gets better. But have we lost the hope of the gospel? Is Jesus not on the throne because Donald Trump was elected president? No, you might question him being on the throne over his haircut, but you cannot question him <laughs> being on the throne over the election. And for those that are out there chanting, he's not my president, well, if you're American, actually he is. And so what do we do with that? We take the love of Christ and we bring that love to a hurting people and a people that are frankly scared right now. And we can, be, we can actually infuse peace into the situation rather than inflame uh, what is already an inflamed uh, people uh, all around us. And so I pray that we would be vessels of, of Christ's peace. And for those of you who have family members that, that you're, you're in tension with your family because they have a completely different vision, we need to know that the country... Can, the country is divided, and what the election showed us, if it showed us anything, is that A, the media, which we live in an age of spectacle, and the media controls our vision and our views and our values almost over everything. We trust media more than our own ability to actually pick up a book and read the facts or read about our own history. Uh, and the media was dead wrong. That's part of the reason there's such an uproar is because it was so shocking. Uh, to everyone, because we didn't see it coming, because we listened to opinions of people who had one agenda, and it turned out the other way, and now what do we do? Who do we trust? You know, once again, we trust the gospel. We trust Jesus, and so as we trust Jesus, we need to realize that if you watch the election in the electoral states and the vote, what you saw is cities were one color, and the rest of the state was another color. And there is, unfortunately, a smugness that comes with urban sensibility. And when I say the pillar of Door of Hope is the city, that we are, we are primarily focused on the gospel, uh, bringing the gospel to the urban core of the city, I am not talking about an urban smugness that we, we know more than all those people out there in the, in the rural, dumb uh, suburbs or small town living of America, because that's my upbringing. Those are my people, actually. Uh, I grew up in Longview, Kelso, and I can tell you that it wasn't, wasn't racial, uh, in, inflammatory racial comments that drove people from my small town uh, to vote the way they did. It was economic despair in a town where all the mills are closed and nobody's got jobs. And so there is incredible healing, and we have an opportunity to be vessels for that healing, and that's by bringing the gospel of peace. We stand against injustice, but we do it in love and we, and we serve those around us. We don't put ourselves above them or over them. Uh, and I pray that this would not be dark days for the church as we experience dark days in our nation. I pray that it would be a time and in our world uh, that it, we would actually with open eyes, Christians should be the ultimate optimist and pessimist all at the same time, is that the scripture says that sin's gonna make the world ugly, but Jesus is already victorious over sin and death and the devil and is coming back to restore all things to himself. And so we say, come, Lord Jesus, come. Uh, so may he be the center uh, and the central hope. I have spoken these things, said Jesus, that my joy may remain in your, you and that your joy may be full. We are told to submit to the authorities that God has placed over us 
And remember, that was written when the worst ruler probably in human history was in control of the known world at that time, a man by the name of Nero. And I promise you that we have never seen a leader as evil as that man was. Uh, and so we can confront dark days with the gospel of light and be confident that there is nothing new under the sun uh, and Jesus is still king, okay? I love you guys. I'm sorry if it's been a hard. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Uh, it's painful for me to see people in pain over this and how do we navigate it. It's a, difficult, it's a difficult topic to navigate. And sadly, if you guys don't know me well, my tendency is when I'm uncomfortable with something is to just utilize humor. Unfortunately, this is one of those areas that is not generally received very well. So, so I've tried to keep the jokes to a minimum. I'm even sorry about the haircut joke. I really, I, I, it's just one area I could not resist. I, I, honestly, actually almost every candidate had horrible hair, just the, the whole election. It's the thing I'm the most grateful for. In my vanity, I was like, just someone fix their hair. <laughs> All right. Uh, we're going to be talking about a word that is crucial, like all the words that we've considered uh, through this series, uh, a word that is crucial to our understanding of what it means to be Christians, and that word is the word salvation. Now, it's funny to me, as a pastor of a church in, in the modern context and in the city uh, that I'm a pastor, that I actually had many young uh, Christians, kids who grew up in the church then walked away. Because when Door of Hope started, one of the things I prayed, I said, Lord, send me all the really crummy Christians, all the ones that like grew up in the church and then walked away from Jesus um, so that they could make a name for themselves in the, in the cool, hip city of Portland. Um, because that was what I was. I, I, kinda, I grew up loosely in the church, but I didn't come to a saving faith until I was 28 because I moved to the city to make a name for myself. Um, and I, I had this weird aversion to everything uh, that, that, that reeked of Christianity. Uh, and so when I started Door of Hope, the Lord blessed that prayer and sent me a lot of really, really, really crummy Christians. Uh, and some of you were those people, and, I, and we embrace you, and I'm glad that God answered the prayer. And, and what I mean by that is, is people that grew up with the, they don't, they, they wanna reject their vocabulary, they don't want, they want a faith that's different than their parents' faith, and they, they're, they don't like the, the cloistered. It's a lot of what even drove uh, the, the frustrations around, around the elections. I don't want to be connected with the Christian right. And, and somehow we took like sacred vocabulary and just lumped it into this group that as if that the word saved is somehow connected with Christian Republican or something. That's saved actually is biblical pretty essential, because I actually had a girl say, I don't like it when you use the word saved. And I'm like, but isn't Jesus chiefly our savior? So how do I get around that when he himself used the word saved? Because she's like, I also don't like born again. And I'm like, you just watched that dumb movie called Saved. And, and and it really wasn't even that dumb. <laughs> and I'm like, but that should not, this should not negate, we can't throw out the baby with the bathwater just because words have been misused and misappropriated uh, by Christians and misunderstood doesn't mean we get rid of them. What it does, what it calls for is a return to a right understanding, a robust understanding of these words. And salvation is essential to understanding the Bible. For the Bible itself is God's saving history over his creation. And salvation is a beautiful word that means much more than what this young woman who said she didn't like the word saved thought it meant. Because for her, saved meant an emotional response and an emotional service where the gospel is presented. The preacher says, if anyone wants to commit their lives to Jesus today, raise your hand or come forward. And, and you raise your hand and abracadabra, you're saved. And that's salvation. Salvation for many Christians uh, has to do in their minds with something that happened to them in the past or something they hope happened to them in the past. Uh, it has to do with this idea that salvation is prim primarily getting out of hell and getting into heaven. But 
it's funny, never once in scripture are we told that we are saved from hell. What we are told that we are saved from is sin, uh, is sin. And sin is, in its essence, broken relationship with God. And salvation, I would argue, in its essence, is a restoration of relationship with God. And this continues on the theme and the thread that Tim and I are continually bringing before you, is that I like to call my theology as relational theology, that the essence of God's very being is that he is relational in the core of his personhood, that God is a community within himself, and that sin is a rupture of relationship between God and his creatures, human beings, and that scripture is about God's salvation history, his saving history, his attempt to save us from that destroyed relationship, and that salvation is directly connected to his restoration of that relationship, which he accomplishes in all of its fullness and perfection through his son, Jesus. And so I want us to actually reframe this concept of salvation. And we have to begin by looking at the way that the word was utilized in the Old Testament. Now, salvation in the Old Testament uh, can refer to an event of rescue from any intolerable situation. In fact, salvation can just simply be translated help. Save me is another way of saying help me. Uh, salvation means deliverance. Deliver me from this enemy. Deliver me from this sickness. Deliver me from this person. Uh, the principal Hebrew term uh, that's utilized for salvation is yisa. And I, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right because I don't speak Hebrew. Tim's not here. So I'm going to pretend and speak it authoritatively that I just pronounced it correctly. It's probably like something more guttural and cool. Uh, and if Tim said it, it would really, it would move you. And when I just said it, it sounded like I said yeast. Uh, and, but I didn't. I said yeast. <laughs> so we'll see if Tim or, or Gary, Gary Bashir corrects me. But I'm assuming no one else here speaks Hebrew, so I'm going to just own that right now, that, that, uh, that statement. Uh, but I can tell you what it means. And the basic meaning of this Hebrew word that is often translated salvation or saved, it literally means, and I think this is so beautiful, its basic meaning is to bring one into a spacious environment. That's not how you would define salvation, right? But that's the basic meaning. And I, I love that. Psalm 1836 kind of gives us that essence. It's it's. You gave a wide place for my steps under me, and my feet did not slip. And from the beginning of its usage in the scriptures, uh, it generally came in, uh, it was utilized in the metaphorical sense of freedom from limitation. Salvation was essentially freedom from limitation. Uh, and and it, was, it, it, it covered a whole gamut of, of realities. It was deliverance from disease, like we see in Isaiah 38, verse 20, from trouble, uh, which we see in Jeremiah 37, uh, from enemies, which we see in 2 Samuel 3.18 and Psalm 44.7. Uh, but the vast majority of the references around salvation directly refer to God as its author. And I think that's really important. But the thing I want you to grab a hold of is this idea that, that salvation to the Hebrew mind is being brought out of limitation into the expansiveness of the God who saves. And I think that's really beautiful. And I think that aligns actually with the way that we would interpret it in the New Testament as well. Because what I want us to fundamentally understand is this, that God saves us because he is our salvation. Again and again, the scriptures declare that salvation is not an event as much as it is a person. You cannot be rescued from a situation 
unless there is a rescuer to bring about that rescue. You cannot be saved apart from a savior. And people are constantly trying to be their own saviors, bringing about their own salvation history and salvation uh, into their lives. I want to save myself from this particular... Why do you think the gospel is offensive to those who are perishing? Because the gospel declares that you are incapable of saving yourself, that you can't be the savior. You're not the superhero of your story but that actually you're more lost than you can even begin to imagine, that you're more blind than you could ever know, that you actually are enslaved in ways that you're not even aware of your enslavement. Isn't that the theme of so many of our, our films today? Look at, look at the presentation of, of unconscious enslavement that we're given in a movie like The Matrix, Look at the ways that an unconscious enslavement is portrayed in what I think is one of the most compelling and intriguing uh, series uh, on television right now, the new version of Westworld, uh, which they have turned that into a whole philosophical exploration of what does freedom actually mean? And are we free? Um, uh, is our freedom merely perceived freedom? But it's a continued theme that we see again and again uh, around this idea that we're actually slaves in a story we have no control over. But what the scripture declares is that God, the creator, the writer of the story, is actually interested in setting the players free. But the freedom comes through the writer actually entering into the story himself and bringing about the freedom that we are incapable of, of creating for ourselves. Salvation is always connected directly to the God who saves. This is essential. Look what Exodus chapter 15, verse two, one of the first times the word uh, is utilized. It actually is utilized the first time in Genesis chapter 49, uh, Jacob, uh, who becomes Israel, uh, declares this, this really cool prophetic, and poetic uh, declaration, blessing over, over his 12 sons. And it, within Genesis chapter 49, he says, I, right in the middle of it, he says, I await my salvation. And even there, there's something more to it than simply, because he just got done going through the prophecy of Judah, that there seems to be, salvation seems to be a person that he's waiting for. Uh, there's almost a messianic tinge or hope uh, a, a hint at that messianic hope within that text. But the first time the word salvation is utilized in a really robust fashion is actually when Israel is delivered, when they cross the Red Sea and, and God actually defeats the very people who had, had enslaved Israel uh, by the crashing down of the water over all of the so soldiers that are pursuing. Remember Miriam, Moses' sister, breaks into song. It's the first worship song uh, that's uttered in scriptures. And the first thing she says in Exodus 15, 2, and this is the children of Israel singing together, the Lord is my strength and my song, and he has become my salvation, my help, my deliverance, my expansiveness. The beautiful thing about this declaration is that salvation is immediately personified. It, not only is God seen as the author of salvation, he himself is seen as their salvation. And what's, what's really incredible about the Old Testament usage of this word is that the word salvation often speaks of deliverance from real physical threats, illness, enemies, countries, uh, but there is always underneath the concept of salvation something that will come into full focus in the New Testament, which is that there is a greater enemy than the enemies that can be touched with the senses. Because Israel may have been set free from Israel, God saved them, but what was the essence of their defeat in the wilderness? He brought them out of slavery that he might bring them into the expansiveness of the promised land. But that first generation perished in the wilderness because the greater enemy was not Egypt. The greater enemy was 
sin. Sin is fractured relationship, and they did not trust their Savior, who was their salvation. They start off singing of God's salvation, and not that much longer, within days, they're complaining about about the situation that they're, you brought us out of slavery, so we're gonna perish now in the wilderness? We'd be better off going back and being slaves. And they even lie about their situation. At least there we had great food. They were slaves. They had nothing. And yet their distrust of God, because sin creates distrust of our creator. Sin is a brokenness. Distrust is always the outcome of wrong relationship, is it not? And so salvation history is already pointing to something much deeper and much darker than physical illness, personal enemies, nations that are a threat to our sovereignty. And that's why we come to the New Testament And what we see is that the messianic hope is going to address salvation in a way that actually brings clarity to what the scriptures have always declared, is that God is our salvation and his very saving presence is fulfilled and culminated in the God-man, Jesus Christ. And that Jesus didn't come to save Israel from the tyranny of Rome, but Jesus came to save humanity from the evils of, of sin, which is the, the robbery. He saves us from the broken relationship that is in place that has put enmity between us and God. And what Jesus does is that he makes it possible, as we looked at last week considering righteousness, is that Jesus makes it possible for God to say of his enemies, I declare you actually my friends. It's profound. When we consider the New Testament, I think of these two verses that are really, really key that Jesus declares. Uh, The first one comes from Luke chapter 19, verses 9 through 10, and Jesus is in the home of Zacchaeus, the little man. (laughs) And Zacchaeus has uh, has been distrustful. He's been robbing people of their money. He's been taking advantage of uh, the situation, he's a tax collector, and, and he is so moved by Jesus who's willing to go and have a meal with him that he declares to Jesus in, in this incredible zeal, he says, I'm gonna, give back, I'm gonna give back everything I've taken plus even more. And it was his way of saying, I, I surrender my life to, to you. And Jesus honors Zacchaeus' faith, and he says this, and Jesus said to him, today salvation has come to this house, since he also is the son of Abraham. Really, really profound statement. For the son of man came to seek and save that which is lost. What did Jesus mean when he says salvation has come to his house today? Was it something that happened to Zacchaeus that is the salvation? Or was Jesus declaring over Zacchaeus, I am your salvation and I am here with you in your house and I, your salvation, have come to seek and save that which is lost. You invited me in, but I was already seeking you, buddy. I was already in pursuit of you. I have come to take you out of the restrictiveness of your selfish life and Zacchaeus reflects tangibly what is an internal change. He goes from being a self-centered man who's, who's deceitful and taking what he can get to, and making it his own, even that which is not his, to all of a sudden he sees the freedom that comes when one is close to Jesus, our salvation. And the moment that salvation is in his presence, he recognizes that I am enslaved by my attempts to get more when in actuality, now that I have salvation, all I need is him. And I'm willing to give everything. I count everything, like Paul says, as rubbish for the knowledge of Jesus Christ. So beautiful 
Because the physical transformation of Zacchaeus, his position in the world is transformed by not something that happened to him, but someone that was with him and said, I have come to seek and save you, to rescue you from the greatest enemy you will ever face, which is yourself. Salvation is a person. Jesus says again in John chapter 10, verse nine, he says, and I love this passage because often people get hung up on the narrowness of our message. That is, can Jesus, is Jesus really the only way? And Jesus says, let me just answer that with scripture. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. You can, you can dance around that text all day long. Uh, but there's a multitude of other texts that declares again and again, how narrow is the way? It's as narrow as Christ was able to define it. The narrowness of the path to salvation is it comes through because salvation is not something, it is someone, a savior. And it's not lots of saviors, it's a savior. Jesus says, I am the door in John chapter 10, verse nine, not I am a door amongst many doors. He says, I'm the door. And if anyone enters by me, notice he personifies entrance into the kingdom by saying, I am the entrance into the kingdom. You come into the kingdom through a person, that is through me. I have come, God, in the flesh to actually restore a relationship that you didn't even know was missing. You're trying to fill and solve the dilemmas of human existence. I am the answer to that dilemma. Jesus is still to this day the answer to the dilemmas of all human existence. And if he isn't, what are we doing here? And if you've come today not knowing Jesus, haven't gone through that door, Jesus is your salvation. Specifically, he's come to save you from yourself. And we stand together as a community, knit together in a common belief that we need saving. <laughs> Christ Jesus came to save sinners of who I am chief, said Paul, the holiest man in the New Testament outside of Jesus himself. Jesus says, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved. I love this. And will go in and out and find pasture, expansiveness. Notice the utilization of the personal, I am your salvation, as well as the Old Testament vision of being brought out of restriction into openness, into freedom, into liberation. I always like to frame it this way. The gospel is a narrow message. The narrowness of the cross is the key to entering in to the vastness of our God's endless and everlasting love. And that is what he feels toward you. And Jesus is God's declaration that he has come to seek and save that which is lost. I love that. Have you entered by that door? Well, understanding uh, salvation uh, in the scriptures is to understand this, that salvation is often used, when it's translated into the English, it's used in, in different tenses. Uh, and there is a kind of a threefold tense in the English. All in, really, in the Greek and in the Hebrew, there's just a, a reality of a continuing factor to the idea of salvation. It's not a one-time event because it's directly connected to the one who is the savior, because God himself is our salvation. Salvation is something that continues and it continues to expand. The expansiveness of Christ, our salvation, continues to unfold as we abide in him, as we stay with him, as we continue with him. And so in the English, it's often translated into three tenses. I have been saved, I am being saved, and I shall be saved. 
Now, in Ephesians 2, 5, we find this great statement that we have been saved. Uh, even when we were dead in our trespasses, we've been made, made us, God has made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. And that is looking at Christ, our salvation, and his saving work, the actual event of our salvation, God accomplishing his saving work through the work of the cross, through the person, through the incarnation, through God in the flesh, through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. So Jesus becomes the actual, final word and ultimate event in God's salvation history. His salvation history is wrapped up in that person of Jesus. And Jesus comes and he actually stands in the gap for us. Not only does he bring deliverance, and what did, what did he say he came to save us from? I will save my people from their sins. I will bring forgiveness to their sins. Salvation is being saved from broken relationship, but it's not just being forgiven for the brokenness of relationship. Salvation is directly connected to the restoration of that relationship. That is why it cannot simply be something that has happened in the past, although there is a point. I never would, would apologize for doing altar calls at Door of Hope because there was a movement over the last 12 years to get away from what, what uh, some in evangelical circles called uh, salvation is, is a process. And I'm like, it's a process, but it's actually also an event, and it's also an eschatological promise, that is, that it has a future fulfillment, but it's all of those things because it's primarily a person. And like any relationship, our relationship with God has to have a starting point. And so you can't say it's a process where you keep exploring the possibility of relationship, because if that's how you treat your marriage, you are a really horrible spouse. You're like, I'm gonna, we're just gonna date forever. Uh, because there's a point, if you're gonna actually move to marriage, where you've gotta propose. Once you've come to the conclusion, I want to spend my life with this person, is that the way that we actually create the freedom of the relationship is through the through the limitation, the expansiveness of human relationship actually comes through the limitations that we place. When I said yes to Darcy, I said no to every other woman. And because I said no to every other woman, all of a sudden Darcy now can open up the vastness of her personality. I can know her in a, in a way that no one else can my right within that covenantal relationship. And now the freedom comes before me because I entered in through the limitation. And anyone who's played with the limitation and said, I don't need that limitation. I love my wife, but I'm gonna sleep with another lady has discovered that it doesn't work that way. For all of those who have pressed and we're gonna see, actually, I guarantee that legislation will come our way not in the not too uh, far uh, in the not distant future uh, for, uh, for examining uh, why we shouldn't allow polygamy. Uh, there's already a, a big move within it. Once you start seeing it in our entertainment, it's all the entertainment does is pave the way for legislation. And once it's in legislation, it's already decided by the American people. And I think that the, this reality is that it's a lie that it's been propagated because there is no safety in a relationship that's merely being explored. There's gotta be a tying of the knot, if you will. There's gotta be commitment. And even as a church, we are covenantal people. And I think that it's important that we actually covenant with our community of faith. This is my church. Like, like, like everything else in life, we seem to be perpetual seekers instead of eventual finders. And that's not the gospel. That's not, that's not Christianity. So we have been saved means that there was a point where I entered into covenant relationship with the living Christ. It doesn't stop there though because the covenant is dependent upon the presence of the very person in whom I placed my faith. He is my salvation. He saved me and that salvation is being worked out as I 
rose from the dead with Christ and entered into the newness of life. We have been saved, but we are being saved. Romans 5.10, it says, for if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. The saving life of Christ is the key to Christian victory, that we have been declared righteous. Relationship is restored. We're justified. We have a new standing with God because of what God has done for us. That's the gospel. It's not what I did for God, but it is what God has done for me. My salvation is based in God seeking me when I was lost and blind. And he is my help. He is my strength. He is my, he is my salvation. For he has saved me from myself and continues to save me from myself because any relationship for us to explore the fullness of that relationship, there needs to be a daily surrender to that relationship for it to actually be vibrant and alive and growing. We are being saved. But the beautiful thing is that the gospel declares a final, a final reality is that we shall be saved. Matthew 24, 13, it says, but the one who endures to the end will be saved. And we say that any relationship that it's possible to destroy covenant because covenant requires two parties who freely give themselves to the other. I, in my freedom, choose to limit myself so that I can enjoy the fullness of this relationship. And to understand that salvation is a person, not a thing obtained, means that the only way that we will ever have assurance of that salvation is if we actually remain in that salvation, which means that we stay close to Christ. I'm not here to challenge those that hold to, the, to a theological idea called assurance of our salvation, once saved, always saved. That very well may be true. I don't know if it's possible to be born again, again, and again. But I will say this, the only person that is assured of their salvation are those who abide in Christ. And even if you are saved, if you neglect your salvation, you'll have no assurance of that rescue. So when Jesus says, I am the door, if anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. Know that that comes in the context of Jesus says, for the thief comes to steal and to destroy. He goes, but I have come to give life and to give it abundantly. And the abundance of life is the liberation of the believer being taken out of restriction and brought into freedom. But I wanna end with this, is that our salvation will have its fulfillment when we see Jesus face to face, we will give an account for our lives. And the question is, is how did we treat that salvation, that gift of salvation? Because if salvation isn't something but someone, if salvation is primarily a return to the Father's house, if salvation is primarily surrender, surrender of my life for the reception of Christ's life, then I would ask you, are you fully surrendered? Because I want you to experience communion, which is the essence of salvation. Communion with God is what Jesus comes to give. In fact, George MacDonald said, oneness with God, which alone is salvation, I think is such a beautiful and profound thing. Salvation and surrender is summed up in Psalm 1, 19, uh, verse 94, when the psalmist says, I am yours, you save me. And I wanna tell you guys right now that the power of salvation is when we understand that Jesus is our salvation and that our salvation is fully experienced, our deliverance, our being put in a broad place is only experienced as we daily present ourselves to the living Christ that we might experience his fullness as we surrender our lives. You guys, for the last four years, my life has not been awesome, actually. Door of Hope has been such a gift to me. 
uh, in, in starting Door of Hope seven years ago, when I first started the church, there was a complete dependence upon Jesus. I had, I had kind of everything to lose and nothing to gain from starting the church. And based upon the statistics, it looked like I would probably lose everything because Portland, they say, is a church planter's graveyard and that 19 out of every 20 church plants fail within the first two years. And so for Door of Hope to succeed as wildly as it did, at least in the eyes, how you gauge success in a church is nearly uh, Im an implausible idea to me. Uh, but I, I, I remember the growth created a season after year one uh, of severe anxiety. That severe anxiety got played out in, in just horrible doubts and fears and, and, and the anxiety almost unhinged me. And after that anxiety, I, after I came out of it, I think that that began uh, a movement toward, there was this really sweet year after I came out of my anxiety where there was just really healthy growth, tremendous amount of conversions, uh, and the church grew so fast um, during year three uh, when it was just me and Evan and Jamie. Uh, we were the only people on staff before I hired Tim, and we were already seeing over 1,000 people come on Sundays uh, with just three people on staff. And that created in me certain insecurities, and those insecurities in me created this, these attempts to try to fix what I perceived as glitches within my own temperament. And, and, and the more I attempted to fix those glitches over the last four years, the more I stopped just giving. I always say that Jesus doesn't want this or that part of you. He wants your gifts as well as your stupidity. I'm really great at preaching that, not so awesome at actually doing it. And, and I started to try to to manage my own glitches in various ways. And the more I tried to manage my own glitches, whether it's through going to the doctor, whether it's through all the different things, if I, you know, if I read more, if I, it was this performance-driven attempt to fix things. But what I found is that surrender began to diminish more and more. And as I began to maybe even get control of particular areas that I thought were faulty before, what that bred is sort of self-sufficiency. Oh, I've, I've read like 300 books in the last three years. Like, this is amazing. Look how awesome I am. I don't need the Holy Spirit. You know, once a pastor said, or a dear friend of mine said to me when I was starting the church, he said, Josh, there's an anointing on your life because you recognize that you don't make any sense and that you need Jesus desperately. Uh, he goes, but I promise you, if you lose your anointing, you will be forced to rest on your own cleverness, and that'll only carry you for a little while. And I think that there is an, a movement toward me kind of focusing on my own abilities, and all it did was reveal my own inabilities, and that created a distaste for ministry altogether. And what I've found over the last four years is that I've just been looking for ways out, ways out, Every week was marked by a new attempt to figure out how to get out of my situation. And some of you may just call it what it is. Josh, you're 43, that's called the midlife crisis. Let's just call it, let's call a spade a spade. Uh, and maybe a midlife crisis is nothing more than a recognition that you just spent over half your life trying to save yourself and to no avail, and now you're almost dead or you're, get, you're closer than you were yesterday. <laughs> you're, all, your, all, all that virile, youthful energy is gone. Now it's just the downhill battle of, of, of failing bodies. Then, then they say you like peak out at like 25, and then your brain cognitive ability is all, everything just goes downhill from there. Uh, and, and, and accepting that maybe the best thing that I could do is accept that though the outward man is perishing, the inward man is daily renewed, but that daily renewal is dependent and hinged upon me actually accepting it, giving Jesus the right to be responsible for me. How can I be saved if I'm constantly trying to save myself? And see, this came all to a head uh, actually a week ago, Saturday, before I preached my message on righteousness. And my wife, I woke up to my wife up really uh, 
she's very early in the morning and she'd been up since two in the morning and she just was so deeply troubled. And she says, Josh, I feel like I'm married to a stranger right now. The man that I love, the gentleness of your personality, you've just gotten more and more edgy and more and more tense. And man, if, if this is what ministry is gonna do to you, then, then you need to figure out something else. But I believe what you need to do is you need to lay down. And she listed listed some things. I don't need to tell you what it is I laid down, but all I can tell you is that she challenged me. I felt it was from the Holy Spirit, and I said, you're absolutely right, and I repented. And the moment I did, I felt the salvation of the Lord, which was his presence, which had been missing for been running this church without feeling the very presence of Jesus. How terrifying. I'm not saying that God didn't work in spite of that. I'm not saying that I was that did anything that was disqualifying as a pastor. I'm saying that it's possible to get up week after week and run a church and preach the gospel and stay true to the scriptures and yet feel absolutely devoid of God's presence because God put forth a very narrow means to salvation, which is Jesus. And that door is so narrow that there isn't room for you to come in with extra stuff. You gotta leave the stuff and he wants you and you alone. And the moment I let go, Lord, I'm done trying to fix myself, you alone. I'm done trying to create uh, some sort of perception that I'm something that I'm not. I am a broken vessel. I'm, you're looking at a pastor with no college education who spent all of his 20s doing hard drugs, who wanted to be nothing more than a rock star, who is an underachiever in every area, and I feel like I've been spending the last four years trying to perform for an audience I don't even know who they are. And Jesus called me to surrender, and the moment I surrendered, salvation became a reality. And I felt it when I preached last Sunday. I felt it. We felt it too. <laughs> Thank you. Jesus wants to set us free. And the freedom that comes into our lives is his very presence as we surrender all. We need to be able to say with the psalmist, I am yours, you saved me. Amen?